Our next case is Dowling versus United States. Uh, you will find that link in your materials, and uh, it is under the heading of uh, culpability of mind. We're talking about your criminal state of mind. And uh, mens rea, or, which is a Latin term, you'll find a lot of Latin terms in, in, in the law. And uh, the, 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 the first question when we're talking about uh, criminal law is what is, one of the questions of criminal law is, what was the state of mind of the uh, defendant at the time of the alleged crime. And the question that's going to be asked when you are in these situations is, uh, is, is, is what does the statute say? What, 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 is, the, what, is, the, what is the law? And uh, in this case, we're talking about the National Stolen Property Act. And it provides as follows, that the imposition, it, it provides for the imposition of criminal penalties upon any person who transports, quote, transports in interstate or foreign commerce any goods, wares, merchandise, securities, or money of the value of $5,000 or more, knowing the same to have been stolen, converted, or taken by fraud. Okay? Now, that knowing is the important part of this particular statute because uh, it is the portion of the statute that requires some knowledge by the defendant, some, some criminal state of mind that, that, that he knows or she knows that what uh, is being done is, is a criminal act. So in this case, uh, what we're going to do is, 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 is try to imagine that you're reading the case. You're going through the case. You're, you're reading the case, and, and you are trying to, to identify uh, what, uh, what's important in this case, What's, what, what, you sh what you need to know, what your professor is going to ask you the next day, and what are the important po points. Now, in this particular case, uh, you're going to say to yourself, okay, what's, what's, what is this all about? You know, I'm reading this thing here, and you're going to find that this is a case involving interstate travel, in interstate, interstate transport of bootleg records, Elvis Presley records. And you're going to look over the facts, and you're going to see that this is a, a case in which uh, one of the defendants was uh, a big Elvis Presley fan, and he uh, apparently at some point had acquired uh, acetates and, and other uh, uh, copies of, of, of studio, un unreleased studio material, um, unreleased Presley records, uh, studio outtakes, out uh, acetates, soundtracks from uh, motion pictures, and tapes of Presley concerts and television appearances. Uh, this was, uh, you know, going on in, in the late 70s, early 80s. So he and his his buddy get together, and um, they have this little uh, illicit operation going on. Uh, they're they're deciding that they're going to make and sell records, Elvis Presley records, based on this this uh, material they've acquired. They um, they don't have a copyright license of any sort. They don't have uh, any agreement with anyone to do this. They don't pay any royalties to, uh, to anybody. They're just, you know, a couple of guys who want to make some money on the side. So they're, they're, they, they start this operation. They start in, um, in, in, uh, in a small manner, and then they let the thing grow. And they have a couple of different operations in different parts of the country where they you know, have these guys pressing these records for them. So the court is faced with, with the, with the uh, situation where there's been a conviction. And the issue that you're going to see here is, is the issue of, of the, uh, the uh, conflict or consistency between the National Stolen Property Act and the Copyright Act. Because the court is, is called here to identify something you're going to see in your materials, whether or not this copyright infringement is a violation of the National Stolen Property Act. Now, the National Stolen Property Act talks about you know, um, uh, making criminal penalties for essentially physically taking something from someone and transporting across uh, state lines. And the, the Supreme Court makes reference to the distinction between that physical conversion, that, that physical taking of physical things um, that was co contemplated by, by the, uh, the Congress in enacting the statute 
and copyright infringement. And the court, you know, makes some, some very important observations, and uh, uh, they, they talk about Dowling's and, uh, stating that he does not contest that he caused the shipments in interstate commerce. He doesn't contest that the shipments had sufficient value uh, to meet the statutory requirement. Uh, he's saying that this was not, you know, stolen, converted, or taken by fraud. And uh, that is the, the, the nub of, of what the court is being called to, to, uh, to determine. The court says, we must determine, therefore, whether phono records that include the performance of copyrighted music compositions for the use of which no authorization has been sought nor royalties paid or consequent, consequently, quote, stolen, converted, or taken by fraud, unquote, for purposes of the statute. And the court says we conclude that they are not. And the court goes into an, uh, a discussion about the distinction between uh, uh, the one as opposed to the other. Uh, they say here that the government's theory would make theft, conversion, or fraud, fraud equivalent to wrongful appropriation of statutorily protected rights and copyright. The copyright owner, however, holds no ordinary chattel. A copyright, like, uh, like other intellectual property, comprises a series of carefully defined and carefully delineated, delimited interests to which the law affords correspondingly exact protections. So the court is saying that the Copyright Act in and of itself provides the kinds of protection that are, 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 are uh, at issue here. And, and the, uh, the, the conflict here with the, uh, with the, um, the, the, the other federal statute, the, the, the federal property statute, is, um, is, is not valid because the federal property statute is is something that is beyond, it, 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 you can't use the federal property statute for copyright infringement purposes. That's essentially what the ruling of the court was. Uh, the court is saying that the, the taking that occurs when an infringer arrogates the use of another's protected work uh, comfortably fits the terms associated with the removal uh, by 214, 2314. The infringer invades a statutorily defined province guaranteed to the copyright holder alone but he does not assume physical control over the copyright, nor does he wholly deprive its owner of its use. While one may colloquially link, colloquially link infringement with some general notion of wrongful appropriation, infringement plainly implicates a more complex set of property interests than does run-of-the-mill theft, conversion, or fraud. As a result, it fits but awkwardly with the language Congress chose stolen, converted, or taken by fraud to describe the sorts of goods whose interstate shipment the section makes criminal. So uh, there you have it. The, the, the Supreme Court was saying that, you know, we, we draw this distinction uh, between the two and, uh, uh, and that uh, we, will, we, will, we will not hold a person guilty of the federal property statute uh, when, in fact, it's a copyright infringement crime. 